Good evening. Let's take our Bibles this evening and turn to the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 29. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And we'll begin reading in verse number 11. 1 Chronicles 29 verse 11 starts off and says, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all, and in thine hand is power and might. And in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Lord, thank you so much for the Word of God. God, thank you for your Spirit. Thank you for how you speak to us and remind us of things. And, and God, uh, uh, speak to our hearts. And God, we ask that you would do that this evening. And uh, Lord, that you would uh, uh, speak to our hearts, give us that which we need. And help us now, Lord, as we uh, consider uh, the God of power. And Lord, we ask that you would just uh, bless now, help me as I preach, uh, get my thoughts together, Lord, and just uh, help me to say the things that you would have for us to hear this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, as you know, we've been talking about quieting the noisy soul. I'm not going to go into uh, uh, any recap th this, this evening, but um, this is our 10th session, believe it or not, our 10th session on this topic. And so... Um, this evening, uh, we're going to be talking about beholding the God of power, beholding the God of power. We just read there in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, and basically what David's saying here is that God is the one with the power. He possesses the power. He is the one who gives strength unto all, whether it's physical strength or financial strength or emotional strength, etc., etc. All strength comes from God. And the God of all power gives us the power we need to quiet our souls and to be at peace uh, here on this earth. And so uh, I want to start off by quoting a man. I believe, I believe how he pronounced his name is Stephen Sharnock. He was a Puritan writer. And he says this about the power of God. He says, The power of God is that ability and strength whereby He can bring to pass whatever He pleases, whatever His infinite wisdom may direct, and whatever the infinite purity of His will may resolve. As holiness is to the beauty of God's attributes, so power is that which gives life and action to all the perfections of the divine nature. How vain would be the external uh, to all the perfections of the divine... I'm sorry. How vain would be the external degrees if power did not step in to execute them. Without power... His mercy would be but feeble pity. Think about that. His promises an empty sound. His threatenings a mere scarecrow. God's power is like Himself, infinite, eternal, and incomprehensible. It can never be checked, restrained, nor frustrated by the creature. God's power is amazing. It's infinite. I mean, and we say, you know, we say the power of God. But as we mentioned last week, sometimes we, 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 uh, we know these things in our head, but to believe them and wholeheartedly uh, uh, practice these beliefs in our life is a whole other thing. Uh, think about this. God can do anything He wants to do. Nothing holds Him back. God can, God can bring anything to pass that He desires. And whatever His divine wisdom dictates, whatever His divine love says is best for His creation, best for us, is exactly what God brings to pass. And sometimes that means painful things for us to experience. And oftentimes when those painful things happen, we are tempted to look at those things and say, that's a bad thing that happened to me. There's even a, there's even a, a phrase uh, that, that's pretty popular. You know, why do bad things happen to good people? And there's books written about that and, and, and sermons preached on that and, and the whole nine yards. And 
can I, can I just suggest for a moment that we remind ourselves on a daily basis that anything that happens to us happens through the filter of a loving heavenly father. We may not like it, but it's not bad. Uh, it's necessary for us. I'm, I was um, uh, preparing this message and I was thinking about uh, years ago, back in uh, December of 2000, I believe it was, my son Timothy, our oldest boy, was six weeks old. And um, I wasn't walking with God like I should have been. And I was backslidden out of the will of God. I was working for a company called Tykert Construction in California, pouring concrete. And um, I was on my way to work. One, uh, one foggy morning, as is pretty common there where we lived in the Central Valley of California. And uh, on my way to work, it was six, six something in the morning, heading from our, my home, which was in Oakdale, California, to Turlock, California, down the back country roads. And a car uh, pulled out in front of uh, oncoming traffic. The oncoming traffic, a, a car pulled out in front, uh, trying to pass seven cars in the fog. I was doing about 50, 55 miles per hour on a backcountry road. And man, I, at first I thought it was just a turn in the road. You know how sometimes it'll, it'll look like the car's in your lane, but it's not really in your lane. And, and uh, that's what I thought it was at first until, man, it just kept on coming. And this car, later I found out it was doing about 70 miles per hour and just hit me head on, head on collision, completely totaled my vehicle. Uh, by all means, I should have died in that, in that accident, but God has hand upon me and and uh, they pried me out of the vehicle, and, and uh, I crushed my foot and got banged up a whole bunch. And, and um, uh, you know, a lot of people would say, well, that was a bad thing that happened to you. You know, years later, God, God used that incident in my life. I can look back and say that God used that to get my attention and to change the, the direction, the course of my life back to him. And through all of that course, uh, that, that, that trouble, you might say, or that pain that happened to me, God called me to preach. God put me into the addictions ministry and all. And I'm, I'm here today where I'm at now because of that incident in my life. God tra- changed my direction. And so we can look back, I can look back at that and say, well, that was a bad thing that happened to me. It was very painful. Trust me, I still feel the pain to this day in my body from that accident. But can I say to you that that was necessary for my life? It was necessary for me to experience that. And sometimes God's strength and power dictates that painful things happen to us. And oftentimes when that happens, we're tempted to look at those things and, and, and believe in our mind, well, well, God wasn't powerful enough to stop that. Or, or, or perhaps we believe that he was powerful enough to stop that, but God wasn't loving enough to stop that. And, you know, years, a few years later, after several surgeries, about two and a half years of reconstructive surgeries on my body and different things of that nature, uh, I was sitting on the front porch of my house. Actually, it was my mother's house. I was living with my mother at the time. We'd lost our house through all that stuff. And and, uh, I was sitting out on the porch. God just stopped me dead in my tracks. And basically laid me on my back for two and a half years, changed the course of my life, not only, not only uh, spiritually, but uh, my career. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't able to do construction anymore. And so here I'm sitting on this, uh, on the, uh, I was in the addictions ministry. I, we had just began that. And I was sitting there meditating and thinking about the things of God. And I think for the first time, I remember looking up to heaven and telling God, thank you for what had happened to me. And I praised him for that because I realized that I wouldn't be where I was had God not loved me enough to stop me dead in my tracks and change the course of my life, stop me from heading down the wrong road. And I thanked God for those things. So what many would think was a bad thing in reality was a good thing. It was good for me. It was necessary for me. And so the the truth is... Not that God's not powerful enough to stop things or that he's not loving enough to stop to stop things from happening to us. But the truth is, in God's love and in his power, he sent these things to happen to us for our good, for our good. He is our father. You got to get that in your head. He's our father. He loves us. And not only does he love us, but he loves to work on our behalf to make us more like him. 
And that's what God's doing in our life. And it's a promise of God that he is working in you that which pleases him. He is, he is, he is making you into the image of Jesus Christ through all that happens to you, whether you think it's good or bad, all things, as the Bible says, work together for good to those that love the Lord and to those that are the called according to his purpose. And so let's take a few moments this evening and look at how beholding the God of power can bring peace to our souls. How beholding the God of power can bring peace to our souls. First of all, we need to look at the fact that God has all power means that he possesses absolute might. Absolute might. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 13. A uh, very familiar portion of Scripture. Uh, what's, what's oftentimes referred to as a Lord's Prayer. Uh, it's not the Lord's Prayer. It's a model prayer. But nonetheless, Matthew chapter 16. Uh, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 6 verse 13 says this. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. That word power there, uh, I think this is how you say it, du uh, dunamis, which is, I believe, where we get our modern English word dynamite. Now, I, I like to blow things up. I like dynamite. Uh, I wish I could play with dynamite and find it readily, but praise the Lord, I can't. It's probably a good thing. But nonetheless, this word is where we get our word dynamite. It means this, power, ability, physical or moral as residing in a person or thing. So what, what we mean when we say that God is powerful, that, uh, in this word here, uh, that God is, uh, that uh, all power is, is His, is we're talking about God's omnipotence, all powerful. He's, he's above all when it comes to power or ability uh, or uh, 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 the power to do things. And so, here, omnipotence, basically, God is able to do whatever He wills in the way that He wills it. God can do anything, anytime He wants to. There's no limits with God. He's powerful. He's powerful. It means that He's able. God is able to keep that which He promises or to keep that which you've committed unto Him. And so let's look at a, a few verses. Uh, go over to 2 Corinthians chapter. 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, in verse number 8, we find this verse, it says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. I like that word abound. It, uh, it's uh, the root word of abundance, uh, you know, abounding. It's, uh, the, in the Greek, it means to superabound in quantity or quality, to be in excess to abound, to have or possess in great quantity, to be uh, copiously supplied. You have enough. You have plenty. It's overflowing. That's what the word means. And so God is able, that's what this verse is saying, God is able to make all grace abound toward who? Other people? No. Toward you. Remember what we said last week? We have to believe that God is these things to me, to us, personally. Not only is God all-powerful and omnipotent and, and all these things in general, but He is those things to me and for me, personally. And so, to make uh, all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things... May abound to every good work. I was thinking about this the other day and how in Ephesians it talks about that we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works, right? Unto good works. God has, God created you for a reason. There's something that God has for you to do. There's, there's, a, there's a, a, a purpose for your life. Uh, specifically that God has for you. No one else can do it. And God not only has created you for that, but He's able and powerful enough to supply you with everything that you need, more than everything that you need, to abound toward that good work, whatever it is. And I found comfort in that. I was like, man, that's incredible. That uh, I remember the first time that uh, I was at a, I was at our church in California, and we had started a, uh, we started a weekly addictions class there. 
And uh, we, we had a residential housing program, residential program like we have now, not the ranch type, but the, in the city we had a house and, and we were helping folks as best we could. And, and I remember having the dream and the vision and the desire to have a property in the country, a ranch in the country with several houses on it and, and uh, you know, and, and this big vision I have, and, and I know probably nobody else could see that and, and, uh, or, or envision that, but that was something that God gave to me. And, and uh, I remember mentioning that in class and looking at all the people's faces when I mentioned that, and it was as if I was saying something that was so far beyond reality that they thought I was crazy. I get that a lot, actually. But, uh, uh, but nonetheless, I, I remember looking at their faces, and I remember thinking to myself later, you know what, they may not believe it, but I believe that God can do it. And, and, and God, God can do it, and God is doing it. And, and even the big visions and stuff that we have now with the, with the ranch ministry and with Victory Ranch and, the, and the, you know, the, uh, on the north side of the property where we have the 30-bed dorm for the men and, and the staff housing and then the, the chapel and the, and the uh, multi-purpose uh, uh, dining hall and, and then the staff housings and the bungalows and all that stuff down further down Hope and I can see it all in my mind right now. And then you cross over the, the, the creek there and you go down to the south end of the property, the south entrance, and you see the, the restaurant that we're going to uh, uh, build down there and the, and the little uh, ranch-style house that folks can tour and look at. And, and then you have uh, Miss Mari's house up there on the staff part uh, uh, of the property. And then, and, then, and then you have a 30-bed facility for ladies. I mean, that's huge. That's just like... You know, you tell people about that, and sometimes they look at it and you think, you're crazy. But God can do it. He's powerful enough to do it. He's, he has might. He possesses absolute might. It's nothing for him to do those things. Nothing. And if God can do all of those things, I learned a while back, several years ago, that if, uh, if God can do all of those things, he can do anything. Listen, financial stuff is like small potatoes when it comes to God. You know what's even more miraculous than that? Is what God does in an individual's heart. What God does in an individual man and woman and how that transformation takes place. You know, a human being can't reach down in there and make that happen. That's a, that's a work of God. That's a miracle of God. And God has the power the might to do it. God can do it. Uh, look over to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. We're talking about the power of God. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 20. The Bible says this. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly. There's that word again. Abundance. Abundantly above all that we Ask or think according to the power that worketh in here's us, worketh in us. That power, and in Ephesians chapter 1, I believe it is, we find the phrase that the same power that raised Christ from the dead, that power worketh in us. We're talking about the power of the omnipotent God of heaven is accessible to us. God has that power. Look at Romans chapter 4. Uh, Romans chapter 4 and verse number 20. Romans chapter 4 and verse number 20. The Bible says in, in regards to uh, uh, Abraham, the Bible says he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. God can perform that which he promised. My grandfather was a great man. 
Uh, he taught me a lot of stuff growing up, and, and I remember a lot of the stuff that he taught me was biblical. I don't know if he knew it was biblical or not, but, uh, you know, he taught me things like, hey, if boy, he always called me boy. He said, boy, if you lie down with dogs, you're going to get fleas, right? I had never heard anybody else say that till a few days ago. I heard somebody, I forget where it was, but they said, they said that. And I was like, hey, my grandpa used to say that. That's the principle, the Bible truth that we teach in the hope class. The company you keep will influence you, right? But nonetheless, my grandpa always, he always uh, used to say this as well. He said, uh, he never did, he never ever, I can't remember one time ever that my grandpa promised me anything. Never promised me one thing in my life. And uh, <coughs> he always said, never make a promise that you can't keep. Never make a promise that you can't keep. And, I, and, and he told me one time, he says, but I don't, I don't, I don't uh, make promises to you because I never know what's going to happen. And I don't want to make a promise that I can't keep. Do you know that God really is the only one that can keep all of his promises? He's able to perform that which he promises. Look over at uh, 2 Timothy and chapter. Actually, before we do that, uh, look at the next verse, verse 21. It says, and being fully persuaded. I'm sorry, we already read that verse. He was able also to perform. But if you look back at the, net, at the last verse where it says, he, he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief. I looked up that word unbelief. It means faithlessness, disbelief, and then uh, unfaithfulness, and it categorizes it as disobedience. Did you know that? Did you know that when we don't believe what God says, God classifies it as disobedience? We dis, we're disobeying God when we don't believe that He can perform that which He promises to perform. Interesting. Look over at 2 Timothy, if you will, 2 Timothy in chapter number 1. 2 Timothy chapter number 1 in verse number 12. The Bible says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. I'm sorry, that was supposed to be 2 Timothy. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 12. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is, there it is again, able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 7. And look at verse number 25, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And again in Jude 24, Jude 24, the Bible says in Jude 24, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. You see, God is able. He has absolute might. He can keep us. He can, he can give us victory. He has all the power that's, that, that is necessary for us to have victory in our life and to get, get victory over the stubborn sins that we struggle with and, and the flesh and the world and the devil. God has the power to, to, to release us from all of it if we just believe in His power. We see God's power, evidence of His power in many, many ways. I mean, you just walk outside, you see the, the evidence of God's power in creation. We see His power in creation. Look at Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah, uh, Isaiah chapter 40. The Bible says in verse, uh, where was I? Verse number 12. Isaiah 40, verse number 12. Who, who, hath, who hath measured the waters in the hollow of His hand and meted out heaven with the span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. I mean, think about that. I was, I was pondering this verse uh, earlier today. It says, who, who hath measured out uh, the waters in the hollow of his hand? That, this part right here is the hollow of your hand. 
And you think of yourself as, you know, kneeling down before a brook or a river. And, and you know, you see soldiers doing this sometimes uh, in movies and whatnot. And they'll reach down and they'll take, a, they'll take a sip out of the hollow of their hand from the water that they swooped up from the river. God, basically this verse means that God can sip up all the water on the planet. Just like in one sip. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, and not only that, but he, he, uh, he meted out the, the, the heaven with a span. I've been told, I don't know, I haven't really studied this, but I've been told a span is like three fingers, you know, the width of three fingers. That, that could be right or wrong. I don't know. I heard that. I haven't verified that. But a span is, is three fingers. And, and, and so God's like, okay, the heavens, eh, they're going to be about that big. I mean, that's how big our God is. And then he says, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure. I'm talking about the dust of the earth. There was, a, there was what was called a dust bowl back in the day that created, uh, that, that made all kinds of people migrate away from, uh, uh, from the dust. I mean, if, if the dust of the earth can do that to human beings, God says, no, I can weigh it in a measure. I, can, I comprehend all the dust of the earth in just a little measure. I got a little measuring device. And he weighed the mountains in scales. I mean, think about that. I'm talking about the mountains, all of the mountains, not just the biggest mountains, all the mountains. God weighs them in scales and the hills and the balance. He's big. I think the proper word for it is immense. God is immense. There's, there's no measure for it. He's huge. And we see the, the, his power in creation. I've been to the Grand Canyon and, and standing there, that, that vast gorge, and, and it makes you feel so small, so small. I love it, just seeing the, the, the power of God through his creation. And not only that, we look at uh, 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 Psalm 33. Psalm 33. Psalm 33, and look at verse number 6. It says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea together as an heap. He layeth up the, de uh, the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Later on, read Job, the last five chapters of Job, 38 through 42. Basically, God's saying, hey, Job, have you done this? Job, where were you when I did this? And I mean, God is so big and so powerful. And that's the God that wants to help us, the God that wants to have a relationship with us. Uh, we see his power. The centurion understood God's power. In Matthew chapter 8, we see there where uh, the centurion uh, came to Jesus and he, and he wanted a healing. And, uh, and, and, and he said, I'm not worthy to, uh, that you would come into my house. Just say in word only. He says, I'm a man under authority. And I say to this, this uh, soldier, go. And he goeth and, and come and he cometh. And he's, under, he's saying, I understand the power that you have. I understand that you can speak and it would be done. I understand your power. Just say it in the word only and it will be done. The centurion understood God's power. Not only do we see his power in creation, but we see his power in preservation. Preservation. I couldn't help but think of that. I think her name's Greta or Gretcha or something. The little whiny, you know, little kid that's whining about climate change. And uh, I couldn't help but think about her when I, was, when I was studying this. Preservation is the act of preserving or keeping safe, the act of keeping from injury, destruction, or decay. We could say providence, the providence of God, the care or the superintendence that God exercises over his creatures. Listen, there's no climate changing that God doesn't know about or that God's not in control of. There's, no, there's nothing happening in the entire universe that God's not in control of. There's, there, uh, he is all-powerful. There's nothing that, I mean, did the grass grow today? Is there grass growing in your yard today? Yes, you don't do that. God does that. He's all powerful. He has the power, the ability. He's able to preserve life. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. 
It's what oftentimes referred to as a hall of faith. Look at verse number one. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the words of God, the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Incredible. God said it and it was done. We see that in Genesis chapter 1 where God spoke the world into existence. And not only did he speak it into existence, but he preserves it by the very act of his will on a constant day-to-day, moment-by-moment basis. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Book of Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 16. The Bible says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And watch this. By him all things consist. That's incredible to me. If God turned his back for one second, if God let go of everything, if God lost control for one millisecond, everything would fall apart. He holds it all together. We consist because he preserves us. God cares for us. He superintends. He exercises his power over his creatures. Not only do we see God's power in creation and and in preservation, but we see God's power in government. In government, say, what does that have to do with anything? Look at uh, Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, if you will. And look at verse number 1. It says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now that's a a pretty uh, hard concept to understand that, that all power, this says all powers, the powers that be are ordained of God. We're not talking just about the United States of America. This book was written before the United States of America, before the Constitution. I mean, we're talking about All government, all power, God uh, uh, has given authority to governments and to to, uh, princes and to rulers and to kings and all those things. And and we see that in this structure is a picture of the authority and the power of God. He delegates his power. And we see a picture of his power and, and supremacy through the, through the government and, and through those who are over us in authority. And, and when we don't understand that, don't comprehend that, and we rebel against authority, no matter if they're wicked or evil or good, the Bible says we subject ourselves to them. And when we don't subject ourselves to them, we're resisting the very power of God. That's pretty dangerous. I don't know about you, but I think I'm just going to get in line and and do what God wants me to do. And that is to be subject, subject to our authority and to the higher powers that God has placed me under. I'm fortunate enough to be a citizen of the United States of America. And we have a constitution, the supreme law of the land. That is our authority that governs this nation. And, and not only that, but it goes all the way down to the, whole, to the, to the civil authority, you know, to the local municipalities and the, and the civil authorities in our life, to, down to the very speed limit and down to the seatbelt laws and, and all those things. And, and it goes from state to state to state. I praise God the day that I moved to Oklahoma, I can blow things up and not have to worry about breaking the law in California. I wasn't supposed to do that. And I'm not going to say that I didn't do that because I did. But I did get right with God. And then it was like God blessed me as soon as I submitted myself and said, God, I'm not going to do that anymore. It's against the law. And so I'm going to, I'm going to refrain myself from doing things that are illegal. It was like a few months later, God says, you're moving to Oklahoma. And I said, praise the Lord. And as soon as I got here, man, we started blowing stuff up. And I don't think we've stopped since. Matter of fact, my boys and I were just talking last night about making a, a bowling ball cannon out of an oxygen tank. That's going to be awesome. Uh, stay tuned for the results on that. 
Uh, I don't know if we're actually going to do that, but I would like to. I don't know how we got off on that. But nonetheless, the power of government, we see God's power in government and in authority. And it gives us a picture of that. Not only does God having all power mean that he possesses absolute might, but also the fact that God has all power means that he possesses absolute right. That means it is his privilege. It is his right And he possesses that absolute right because he's all powerful. Look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 29. Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 29 says this. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. That word there is another form of the word power. I don't know how to say it in the Greek, but it denotes freedom of action or the right to act. Uh, it's used of God. It is absolute. It's unrestricted. He, he taught them as one who had authority. There was none above him. There was none. Oh, he didn't answer to none. And he was the supreme ruler. And he taught such as such. He was unrestricted. When it's used of men, it means that that authority has been delegated to them. By who? We just talked about that. By God. He delegates authority. God has absolute authority, and this means that God is in absolute control. He never loses control. His control is absolute. If there's there's any event in the universe that God cannot control right now, then he's not God. If there's any atom in, in the universe that God doesn't control right now, then he's not God. But the fact is, is that he is God, he's omnipotent, and that means that we can trust him. We can trust him. When he says something, that's it. We can trust him. He has the ability. He's able to keep his promises. And God's control, not only is it absolute, but sometimes it's not always apparent. If we had the ability to, we could ask Job what he thought about God's control. There was a time in his life that it wasn't apparent that God was in control. And sometimes it's like that with us. God, what are you doing? I don't understand it. But just because we don't understand it doesn't mean that he's not in control. You see, God permits for reasons only known to him people to act contrary to and in defiance of his revealed will. And that's the reason for the wickedness and the evil in the society that we live in today is because people are acting contrary to the revealed will of God. And God allows that for some reason. And he allows people to act contrary in defiance uh, defiance of of his revealed will, but he never permits them to act contrary to his sovereign will. You'll never break the sovereign will of God, ever. You can't. It's impossible. He's in complete control, and he never loses control. In our text that we started with back in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 29, again in verse 11, David says this, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty, for all that is in heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Power and might come from God. He never loses control. You don't have what you have today because you're smart or because you're able or because you're competent or because of any of those things. You have what you have today because God allows you to. And you have what you have today because God gave it to you. Thank God for what he gives us. In Nehemiah chapter 9, Nehemiah chapter 9, look over at verse number 6. The Bible says, Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. 
Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. God is omnipotent, all-powerful. Psalm 103, in the book of Psalm 103, in verse number 19, we see this. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Yeah, that's wonderful. God is above all. He's all powerful. Behold the God of power. There's nothing that gets by him. In Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 6, we read, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent, and He's all-powerful, reigneth. That's the God that we serve. That's the God who loves us. That's the God who reached down from heaven and saved our souls. That's the God who died for us. That's the God who preserves us. That's the God who, 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 uh, who uh, gives us bread and, and gives us rest. And that's the God who quiets our soul. The one who has all power is always in control. Even if it doesn't look like it, even if you don't think he's there, he's always in control. And it is that truth that God's power to fulfill everything that he promised, that truth gave Abraham stability. That's what gave him courage to offer up Isaac upon the mountain as a sacrifice because he knew that God had promised to use Isaac and that God had power to raise him from the dead. He believed in God's power. God has the power to keep his word. That's what sustained Esther. That's what sustained Ruth. And that's what uh, carried Moses through and Joseph through the hard times because they all knew that the promises of God, they all knew the promises of God. And not only did they know the promises of God, they believed the promises of God and they believed that he had power to keep his word. It basically sums up in this statement. God is able. Do you believe that? God is able. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, tonight for the blessings of your word and how you've given to us the revealed will of God and the promises that come along with this book. God, help us to know these promises. Help us to believe these promises and help us to look to you as the God of all power to fulfill these promises in our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.